time I'd like to call to order the Monday, February 3rd, 2014 meeting of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners to order. At 6 o'clock, we had a work session where staff uh, went over some proposed waterline extension policy changes that will be considered in a upcoming meeting. At this time, I would like to have our invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance from, as he is affectionately known, Pastor Bill. And uh, if we could all stand, I'd appreciate it. From Moyoc United Methodist Church, by the way. Yeah, pray first. Pray first. Yes, sir. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, the snow has come and the snow is almost gone. So it's back to business tonight. So thus, Father God, we seek blessings on the task before the county commissioners this February evening. Bless their efforts with clear insight their deliberations with wisdom, their work with clarity and accuracy, and their decisions with impartiality. May they use their God-given skills tonight and judgment, keeping themselves impartial, neutral, as they consider the merits and pitfalls of each matter on the agenda before them. And may they always act in accordance with what is best for our community and our fellow citizens of Caratuck County. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this night, and all the citizens say... Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Bill. At this time, we're going to move to approve the agenda. Uh, is Ms. Kelly here? Okay, she is here. I didn't see her in the back. I'm going to ask that we move administrative reports to go behind public comments and that we add to the consent agenda a resolution opposing the unfair property insurance increases. We have a motion. So move. So move. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. We'll open our public comment at this time. Uh, Mr. McCree will be keeping the time at three minutes. Our first uh, person signed up tonight is Miss Mary Etheridge. Good evening. My name is Mary Etheridge, and I live at 846 Shawborough Road in Shawborough. My family and I have been involved in litigation with the county after four of the sitting commissioners, Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Adlett, Mr. Petrie, and Miss Gilbert, approved a junkyard to be located on 1.1 acres of land in the Shawbur neighborhood. Not one entity in the county recommended this approval, but they approved it anyway. We appealed their decision and the Superior Court of North Carolina confirmed what they did was wrong. But even with everyone saying what they did to us was wrong, not one of them have said maybe they made a mistake or offered an apology, or even cared that our challenge in their decision has been a monetary burden to our family. Nothing, not one thing. But at the last county commissioner meeting on January the 6th, while discussing the Moyoc Crossing, Commissioner Adlett was very concerned if this housing project would be compatible to the surrounding area. The board decided that they would like to have a study to see if a housing project would be in harmony with an existing housing development down the road. So why on December the 5th, 2011, did they not care what the planning board, the planning staff, the planning director, the sheriff, the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resource, Resources or anyone else said about a junkyard in the middle of Shawborough not being in harmony with the neighborhoods if they are so concerned about compatibility. Why would they approve a junkyard in the middle of a neighborhood on 1.1 acres of land against everyone's recommendation? I guess everyone should ponder that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Southridge. Next, we have Will Crotick. Good 
Good evening. My name is Will Craddock. I live at 182 Brumley Road in Nasala. I'm here to talk about um, some things that um, um, in, are involving combination classes in the Currituck County Schools. And um, uh, about a year and a half ago, when they started combining classes over at Knott's Island Elementary, is when I first started obviously being concerned and aware of it, actually. Since then, I've been attempting to get information from the school board, and quite honestly, I've gotten a lot of information, but it's taken a tremendous amount of effort. And as I went further and further along, I was more and more troubled, quite honestly. So I'd like to go ahead and inform any person, grandparent or parent, taxpayer, resident, any person that is unaware that, first of all, to my um, um, surprise, the current operating budget for the Currituck County Schools is $38,778,689.89. So just shy of $39 million if we want to use round terms. The local monies provided by Currituck County are $11.3 million. Okay, just shy of a third roughly 30%. We have 14 combination classes countywide. <clears throat> According to Ms. Scholler, it would take um, $400,000 to remedy this problem. 1% of the current operating budget would mean that every class in Currituck County would have one teacher instead of one teacher being responsible for two curriculums. Okay, so that's 1%. While they're telling me they're broke, I'm looking at 1%. Anytime I've ever done any business, and I've worked for myself ever since I was nine years old, 1% in any budget, whether it be my household budget or any business I've ever operated is, is not even on the chart, whether it goes to the positive or to the negative. 1%, really, guys? Meaning we have an educator in every class. So I'm looking at this and I go keep finding more and more things. I'm like, okay. So then I find out we got $2.5 million in cash surplus that goes on spent. $2.5 million not included in the $39 million is in the bank. So we're talking 16% of the cash on hand would remedy that problem. 16% of the cash on hand. So, you know, uh, the further and further I went along, the more troubling and eye-opening this became. Uh, every person I've spoke with that I talked to about this finds it equally troubling. The only people that I've even spoke with that didn't find it troubling was the people that were making the budget, that are employed. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking to myself, well, the most effective, excuse me, one of the most important factors in a young child's life is a high quality education. And I asked myself, 1% of the current operating budget, $2.5 million sitting in cash reserves, going unspent at the cost of young children. Anytime that you do something and you don't put 100% forward, you can't get 100% out. So asking one educator to be responsible for two curriculums. That's time, Mr. Chairman. Go, go ahead and finish. Okay, excuse me, sir. I'll wrap it up. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, basically, I'm just trying to let people know, because it was shocking to me to find out what the actual figures are and what little in the scheme of things it would take to fix this. I mean, I hear people come up here and talking about, uh, you know, fire hydrants to lower their uh, insurance premiums, and I hear about worrying about paying a toll for a ferry, and I hear about this and hear about that, and now, I'm not saying any of that is not important. But if there's something that's got to be important, it's got to be the kids. So I'm saying, what is going on? Does somebody want to help me, you know? And I'm not just saying you. I'm talking to the citizens of Currituck County, the grandparents, the parents, the taxpayers, the future taxpayers. I would think anybody that's involved with real estate or development would be concerned about this. You know, where our taxes just went up 51.5%. They went from 32 cents per hundred to 48.5% per hundred. That's a big increase. That's like me going to work 
on Friday, making $15 an hour, and coming in on Monday and telling my employer that I want $22.50 an hour. All I'm saying is $400,000. They need one teacher for every class, and I would appreciate anybody's help. Mr. Crotick, I have one question for you. Have you gone and spoken to the school board? Um, I intend on doing that, but what I have done, sir, is I got a copy of their budget. Right. And the way that you have to cross-reference it, as confusing it as it is, me and my 12th grade education, and I got a lengthy correspondence with Ms. Scholler, which I uh, attached a copy of to each and every one of you, as well as each and every school board member, with no response. No response. I'm troubled, quite honestly, troubled. I'm hoping that the citizens of this county will be equally as troubled and we'll get something changed because what we need to do is we need to revisit this budget. Now, I'm not saying you guys do, but if, if you're giving up $11.5 million and it's very little restriction on it, then maybe we need to say, hey, before you spend a third of our money of, on the budget, maybe you need to make sure that there's a teacher in every class. I'm, I'm very disturbed by this, quite honestly, very. I'm amazed that all the people that I've made aware of this and all the efforts and how I have to refine my questions to get any information. Let me tell you something. Ms. Scholler should have her finger on the pulse of this budget. She initially, if you re review your emails, told me that it would take 14 teachers to remedy this problem at a cost of uh, 700000 Then when I pointed it out that that didn't make sense and told her as to why, she responded that I was correct and it would only be eight teachers and $400,000. It's a drop in the bucket. They spent $480,000 on those school buses last year. They spent $50,000 to pave half the parking lot at Knott's Island Elementary School. And they're spending another $50,000 to pave the other half this year. I'm not saying all the money comes from the same pot, and I understand some of it's got to be done for, spent for certain purposes from the federal government and the state. But your money, as I understand it, as my research tells me, is very little restriction on it. Very little. Well, let me, let me clarify. Yes, the school sir. board is duly elected. Yes, sir. We provide the funds. Yes, sir. We do not tell them how to spend the money. That's where the restrictions come in, sir. That's what I'm getting at. Right. I'm saying if you're providing the money and it's the taxpayer's money and there aren't any restrictions on it and they can do as they please with <clears throat> it, well, yes, the school board, they vote to approve the budget that this superintendent <laughs> presents them. And I'm saying... That's a lot of money. They need a teacher in every class. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Next, we have Bob and Debbie Doris, or just Bob, maybe. Uh, sir, I'm respectfully requesting I withdraw my name from the list. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's all we have signed up for public comment. Is there anyone else who did not sign up? Hearing none, I'm going to close public comment and move to our next agenda item. Administrative reports, a presentation by Ms. Willow Kelly on the Bigert Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act. Good, Good evening. evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here this evening, Chairman O'Neill, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> I am here to talk to you tonight about the impact of the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012. And um, <clears throat> I am first um, Government Affairs Director for the Outer Banks Home Builders Association and the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. I also serve as President of NC20, a coalition of the 20 uh, Eastern North Carolina counties which make up um, the CAMA jurisdiction. Um, we have focused our attention recently on homeowners insurance issues, flood insurance, stormwater rules, et cetera, but uh, homeowners insurance and now flood insurance seem to be on the forefront. <clears throat> To give you a little bit of background about um, the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, um, Congress uh, passed a bill in July of 2012, the Surface Transportation Act. The Surface Transportation Act was a very lengthy document, over 600 and some pages long. The Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act was a section of that bill which was found on five, page 512. 
Um, the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act had been debated for about four or five years, actually more so since Hurricane Katrina slammed into New Orleans in 2005, along with two other hurricanes, which um, caused uh, great stress to the National Flood Insurance Program and payouts. It caused the flood insurance program to be about $18 billion in debt due to payouts from Hurricanes Katrina, Wilma, and Rita. And ever since then, there's been a lot of debate whether the f federal government should even be in the flood insurance business, um, what can be done to more stabilize and shore up the National Flood Insurance Program. So this has been a long, drawn-out um, debate on what to do, and then Congress um, last year inserted this um, Bigger Waters, named after two congressmen. Waters, it seems kind of funny that it's on flood insurance and the bill is Bigger Waters. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> it's actually two congress um, people named Maxine Waters and another congressperson who's no longer in office. But um, <clears throat> here we are left with the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act passed July of 2012. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program covers uh, 22,000 communities in the United States. It collects about $3.5 billion a year in premiums. Um, there are 5.6 million policyholders in the National Flood Insurance Program. The majority of those policyholders, actually 30-some percent, are in Florida. Um, in North Carolina, um, we have been a donor state to the National Flood Insurance Program, paying in $200 million more in premiums than actually claims that have been paid back. So North Carolina has supported um, other states where payouts have been much greater in Louisiana and Texas. The reason for the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, of, as I've already stated, is to stabilize and shore up the National Flood Insurance Program to address the debt of the program. Um, unfortunately, the fine print in the bill, while it did do one great thing and it did reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program mm -hmm. for five years, um, there were instances over the last several years where the flood insurance program had actually lapsed and people trying to close on a mortgage could not do so because the flood insurance program had lapsed and they were waiting, waiting for Congress to um, create an extension or to reauthorize the program. The one good thing about the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act is that it does reauthorize the flood insurance program. Uh, for five years. So we don't have to worry about any mortgages hanging in the balance of which there were about 1,500 a day across the United States. Um, the bad news about the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act is it makes great changes to premium and rate structure in the National Flood Insurance Program. If you have a uh, property that is in a special flood hazard area, um, SFHA is the acronym for that, um, you are required to carry flood insurance if you have a mortgage. So who this is impacting in these changes to rate um, and premium structure that are greatly impacted by Bigger Waters are those people with a mortgage. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the provisions I'm going to talk about here. NC20, um, the Outer Banks Home Builders and Outer Banks Association of Realtors, strongly believes that the ever-increasing cost of property insurance, whether it be wind and hail, whether it be homeowners, and especially now with what is happening with flood insurance, um, greatly impacts those people that are trying to hold on to what they have. They're the middle class, the mortgage holders um, of our communities, and the reform measures that were included in Bigger Waters um, is actually going to make, um, and we've already seen examples, where it is causing flood insurance premiums to be unaffordable, where we feel that it's going to prohibit buyers from qualifying for a mortgage. It does have the possibility to force people into foreclosure, force businesses to close, lower property values, and the list goes on and on. There are two specific sections of Bigger Waters. Um, one has already been implemented. Section 205, it's 100205 of the bill, impacts pre-firm properties. And in the National Flood Insurance Program, you have properties that were in existence when flood insurance maps became effective. And in this area, it's somewhere around 1974 to the um, late 1970s, flood insurance maps became effective in communities participating in the program. So if you already had a structure, and you're all familiar with zoning and grandfathering and, and when laws change, you know, if you have an existing structure, um, <clears throat> then those structures could those homeowners that had structures in those areas could purchase flood insurance at a great discount. And the public has been led to believe that the term for those properties are called subsidized properties. And subsidy, one would perceive, would think that the government is actually paying something 
for them on their behalf or they're getting money from the government if it's subsidized. That's not the case. Um, I have uh, asked people to please stop using the term subsidy, subsidized, even though that's the way it's written in the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, um, that it should be discounted. Pre-firm properties, pre-flood insurance rate map properties got great discounts in the flood insurance program to encourage those existing um, homeowners um, or business owners, et cetera, to participate in the program. So as of January 1st, 2013, if you had a second home in the National Flood Insurance, if you had a second home policy in the National Flood Insurance Program that was pre-firm, in 2013, when you got your renewal, you started seeing a 25% a year increase, only for second home policies. As of October 1st, of 2013. If you were a pre-firm commercial property owner, if you had experienced repetitive losses in the flood insurance program, um, you also started seeing after October 1st 25 percent a year increases. Um, <clears throat> and you may not have seen it yet because your renewal might not have come, come in the mail yet. Also, who was affected as of October 1st, 2013 was um, those policyholders that happened to buy a house after the effective date of Bigger Waters of July 2012 that their real estate agent could not have told them, could not have, um, and, and real estate people operate on integrity and disclosure to their clients. There was no way that they could have told this buyer in August of 2012 that the house they were buying was all of a sudden going to see an increase after October 1, 2012, which could have made them not qualify for their mortgage. And we've seen examples of that already. Um, we are at an advantage in North Carolina because our flood maps, new flood maps, have not become effective yet. The next section of, of Bigger Waters is Section 207, and this will affect 80% of the flood insurance policyholders in the United States. And what this provision says is that whenever flood maps become effective, new flood maps, whether updated, revised, become effective, the policyholder will have to pay to whatever that flood map says. And we pay premiums and rates based on flood zone and flood elevation, base flood elevation. So if when you built your house in 2005, um, your flood zone was an AE zone, which is a less riskier zone than a VE high velocity zone, and you were at a certain base flood elevation, we know here in, Dare, in Currituck County and Dare County, Eastern North Carolina, flood maps last became effective in 2006. In 2006, your zone may have changed, but you didn't pay to a risk of your zone. You always paid to whatever the government told you to build to, the standard in place at the time of construction. Where Bigger Waters is such a game changer and could force people into foreclosure, and these are your year-round homeowners, these are your people working and living in your community, is that you have a flood insurance policy in place, you played by the rules, you did what the government told you to do, you built to this base flood elevation, you were in this zone. Now, if the maps change this year and you're in a riskier zone or a lower flood elevation, or if they change seven years from now, this law says you now pay to whatever the latest map says. And we are already hearing examples where this is impacting people trying to buy a home where a flood policy does not exist, where they cannot assume the policy until the new map comes out, where we have seen an example um, in one instance of a house three rows back from the Sound in Avon where the former flood insurance policy was $1,200. The um, <clears throat> owner of the home, the house went into foreclosure, the bank owned the property, the bank was trying to sell the property. Over the past year, because of bigger waters, three buyers came in to buy the property. When they went to get a flood insurance quote, because the home was moved into a higher riskier zone, the new flood premium on that home, sound side three rows back, not flooded in Hurricane Irene, is $15,000 a year. So this is the impact that we have the potential to see, especially in the Kerala area where homes were built in C zones, where homes were built in X zones, and we even know based on the 2006 maps they're in a riskier zone. We are seeing increases of 2,000 to 3,000 percent in other communities where flood maps have become effective in New Jersey and Louisiana. 
Um, we are working with a national coalition, the Coalition for Sustainable Flood Insurance. Their website is csfi.info. Um, we are also working with a couple of other groups to raise um, awareness and attention to the issue. Um, you probably just heard last week the Senate passed a bill, Senate, 19, Senate Bill 1926, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act. Um, by a vote of 67 to 32 with a lot of lobbying from citizens and people sending in examples, um, within two days of giving a presentation on the Outer Banks, I got about 27 emails from folks that have already been impacted even without new flood maps becoming effective. Either they didn't have a policy in place and tried to go get a new one, they tried to refinance their house and was told that, well, if you're refinancing, you're now going to have to pay to the latest map. Um, or situations where there's been buyers come forward and um, um, have walked away. In the particular situation with the house in Avon, it, the house and the land, we are not talking about a big house, was $189,000. After three buyers, a cash buyer came in and that house was sold for $149,000. So think of the impact on your tax base when you see a decline in property values like that because the cost of insurance is going to affect the affordability of housing and the market value of that house. Um, <clears throat> to think that you could, have, you could have applied for a mortgage in 2005 and then found out in 2014 that all of a sudden your flood insurance is going to be so high that you would have never even been able to qualify for your mortgage in the first place. So we're very concerned. Um, there's been a lot of debate about second homes and the, um, the argument that, well, if you can own a second home, Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, if you can own a second home, then you should pay more for flood insurance. <laughs> First and foremost, we'd like to share with the Currituck um, Board of Commissioners, and as we've shared elsewhere, we would like to get the message across that ownership does not and should not differentiate risk. But actually, in the National Flood Insurance Program, it already does. Because if you are a policyholder of a second home, of which you do not live in more than 80% of the year, which is defined in bigger waters, um, you have less coverage but pay the same rate as perhaps your neighbor that lives in his house year-round. Uh, primary resident policyholders get full replacement cost coverage. If your heat pump is damaged, you get whatever it costs to replace that heat pump today. If you have a second home and your heat pump is damaged, that heat pump will be depreciated yet you pay the same rate. This was not even brought up in debate and discussion through our national associations, our National Association of Home Builders, National Association of Realtors, when um, they were arguing the issue about second homes. Second homes should pay more. Risk, um, ownership should not differentiate risk. We would like for everybody to, to stress that message. We've had meetings with Burr's office, Hagen's office. Um, Senator Burr and Hagen, we um, are very happy to hear that they did vote for the Senate Bill 1926. Um, it is a step forward. It does not change anything today. It still has to go to the House. Um, there's a lot of politics behind this with um, a climate action task force um, that is opposed to any changes. Um, there is the concern um, from, from others, a group smartersafer.org, our friends, Defenders of Wildlife, National Wildlife Federation have been lobbying hard. They've said that the flood insurance program has allowed for development in riparian sensitive areas where it otherwise would not have taken place. Um, we like to bring up the fact that New York City was long in existence before the National Flood Insurance Program, as was Philadelphia and other coastal cities in the United States. Um, <clears throat> NC20 and other organizations certainly support a fiscally sound, actuarial, responsible, and cost-efficient National Flood Insurance Programs that does communicate to citizens their true flood risk. We support flood hazard mitigation efforts and programs. We do not support perverse incentives to build in harm's way, nor do we support the continued subsidization, subsidization of severe repetitive loss properties. However, we must protect property owners who have played by the rules and built as the government told them. We must also ensure we're informed and communicating factual information, not conjecture of, or opinion, as we move forward and work together to strengthen the sustainability of the program. Um, our big question to FEMA is, the flood insurance program only has $250,000 of coverage for any residential property. How can a homeowner be expected to pay fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand? We've even heard of these premiums a year when you only get $250,000 worth of coverage. Um, <clears throat> there's a chart I like to share with folks. This is actually from FEMA, and this is goes through 2011. 
Um, National Flood Insurance Program was self-sustaining. And if you can see the good years here in blue, more money came in than was paid out in claims. Bam, 2005 was the game changer, and, and that's what we're all going to be paying to in the future if we allow this co to continue. Um, we feel there are other ways to stabilize and shore up the program. 1% of all policyholders make up 30% of the losses in the program, and those are severe loss properties. Most of those are pre-firm older homes. If we did more to mitigate the flood loss in those areas, um, the cost and efficiency of the program we feel needs to be addressed, mapping. Um, certainly in communities there are places where flood maps had not been updated in 20 years or more so we need to ensure that flood maps are accurate and reflecting a true flood risk again how do you come up with a premium and a, or a rate that could cause a premium to be thirty thousand dollars a year um, <clears throat> we have established an email address ncinsurancehelp at gmail.com if anybody out there has any stories to share of how they're being impacted and they don't know where to turn first and foremost we would like for citizens to contact their insurance agent um, and ask them how this may impact them um, what they can do to mitigate flood hazard is there any way to install flood vents is there any way to look at elevating um, in FEMA's own brochure they just said well just consider remodeling or rebuilding just rebuild your house well not exactly um, an easy easy thing to do um, we feel there are other ways that we can look at um, at shoring up this program we feel there's a lot of information that Congress was not made aware of when they voted on this Maxine Waters even came out this um, past year and said that the um, unintended consequences of bigger waters are unconscionable and she will do everything that she can to fix this however we're facing an uphill battle and we do need support from the Kurdish Board of Commissioners and the citizens to help make that happen. So, thank you. Questions? Anyone have any questions? I do. Ms. Kelly. Yes, sir. Um, I'm glad you go. You went to see Senator Burr. Yes. We're going next week. We're going to remind him of it. Thank you. Where does Congressman Jones stand? Have you? Uh, Congressman Jones has actually been with us since spring of last year and actually the White House issued a statement um, prior to Senate Bill 1926 being heard on the floor and they offered their opinion on the bill and they actually opposed any changes. Congressman Jones um, submitted a press release and blasted the White House for, um, for that, for that uh, position. Now I, th I think 66 votes will override a veto, is that right? 67. 67. 67 to override the veto right yeah and we're trying to, the there is a house bill that um, uh, House Bill 3370 which is the companion bill to the Senate bill which already has 181 sponsors I think we need to get to 218 to ensure that the bill is is heard and gets passed yeah, but, uh, how many do you need on the veto to override the White House Second, three, fourths. let's see it's two-thirds in the Senate and the House may be three quarters, or is it two thirds in the House as well? It's a substantial. It is a substantial of number. We are trying to get the 218 to make sure it gets passed. There are members, though, that serve on the Climate Action Task Force. There are ten members, I think, that actually um, supported this bill in the Senate. So that was that was good news for us. However. Um, you know, from what I'm hearing from D.C., and I, and I just got an update from a, a lobbyist in D.C., giving a little bit of the background about, um, you know, what's happening behind the scenes is uh, this may not, this, the House bill, even though we were so thankful that Senator Burr's office in his position that he stood behind his vote on Bigger Waters, um, <clears throat> that he did vote for this bill, that um, the House bill may not even be heard until March if it gets heard. So we just need to keep the pressure on to see that the House bill gets heard. If one family is forced out of their home because they can't afford their flood insurance premium, then this is a bad bill. And, and that's what we expressed to Senator Burr's office. We have a, an extensive military community in North Carolina along the coast and in other areas. Um, we have families. I remember going to a hearing last year on homeowners insurance and a woman stood up and said, my husband's in Afghanistan. If my homeowners insurance goes up 30 percent, we're going to have to move. So it is something that affects not only the affordability to buy a house or finance a house, but to stay in your home. How about Butterfield? Um, 
I'm not sure where Butterfield is. We spoke to Butterfield last summer when we were in D.C. about this. I mean, this kind of came out of nowhere that everybody was taking bows and curtsies over the flood insurance program being reauthorized, and then we started looking at the fine print, and we said the loss of grandfathering is going to be huge. You could always grandfather your zone and your elevation. And we know the impact of the 2006 maps um, here where zones and elevation change greatly. And um, we started talking. We held like a flood insurance summit in April of last year where we brought, rep brought in representatives from Burr Hagen Jones' office. Um, our national association leadership came in, um, gave them examples. And unfortunately, we don't have the examples like other states have right now with the flood map changes. Um, we're, like I said, anybody trying to refinance, um, all of a sudden they're being told, well, this is what your flood insurance premium is going to be. And they say, well, we'll just forget that lower interest rate and we'll keep what we have. <laughs> well, I have a couple comments I'm going to make. Number one, any bill that Maxine Water sponsors, no good is going to come from it. We will I knew next, that as soon as I read she co-sponsored it. She is from California. The, the next and thing is <laughs> the comment about anybody that can afford a second home maybe can afford this. One thing they're missing is, is a lot of people, that's their retirement program, and it's not that they're laying on the beach drinking uh, martinis and eating shrimp. They're working, and that's, they're putting that money in as a retirement program instead of a 401K or whatever. Absolutely. And the third thing is when we start, when those um, premiums start going and people start walking away, whether it's in Curry Tuck, Dare County, Carteret, New Jersey, or whatever, it's going to create. The issue is, is the politicians in Washington D.C. created this fix that when it go, when all the mortgages start going boom, they're going to go bail the banks out, and here we go again. They create the problem, and they just transfer the money to fix the problem, and they keep getting elected so that they can fix the problems they create. So. Everybody needs to start contacting their Congressman Jones, Senator Burr, Senator Hagan, and we need to make sure we've got the information, the email address and everything that you get it to uh, Ben and, and Mary so that we can put it on our website. We do have some press here tonight. Hopefully they'll get that information in their stories as well. And I will share with you, Chairman O'Neill, that I am the owner of a second home, which is a year-round rental in Currituck County. Um, when the market wasn't so great a few years ago, I decided to take it off the market and rent it, which I'm sure a lot of people did, and I found a year-round renter. And um, I'm a second homeowner. Um, and when I found out the difference between the gentleman next door who lives in his house year-round and my second home policy not having the same coverage, um, I was very upset about that and that that wasn't shared with members of Congress when they were debating this. There are a lot of people in that situation that are second homeowners, you know, whether because of a move or, in my case, name change, um, that, uh, that are second homeowners because of that. But we rely on the second homeowner and its investment in our communities. And, um, and like you Their said, economy. it's our economy. So uh, this is not, um, I don't know if you saw the News and Observer in their nice little cartoon about people holding up, four people holding up a big, huge house on the beach, sipping champagne. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that that is allowed to, to uh, take place and continue. Well, but that's the message people seem to get. One thing is very important. Most of our second homeowners live in other states. Correct. Northern Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, whatever. So we need to get the message to those people. They have congressmen just like we do. Yes. So it's very important that between Dare County and Currituck County, there's a lot of people in, in, in the Northeast that own second homes. Yes. In Curry, Tuck, and Dare. We work really well with the, um, the Property Managers Association and the property management companies and sending out information and calls to action to their owners to try to get them involved. Um, this Senate bill, I will say this, uh, Senate Bill 1926, it will delay any changes due to the loss of grandfathering for four years. This is not going to help um, the folks... Um, there's a gentleman who owns a motel on the beach road, a pre-firm motel. I had him call his agent and said, if I sell my property tomorrow, what's going to be the flood insurance program for, or what's going to be the flood insurance premium for the new buyer? He pays $5,600 a year now. The new premium, if he sold his property tomorrow, would be 55000 
this bill is not going to help those people with pre-firm properties. It will help the 80% that are post-firm that played by the rules and delay it for four years in the hopes that in four years all of these organizations can come together and <clears throat> local governments and whatnot to work on how can we really um, work on reforming the flood insurance program. Mm. Chairman, any other questions? Just yes, a comment. Just a comment. <clears throat> Willow, thank you so much for coming. Thank As you. always, anything you take on, you're well educated and well versed, and yeah. just do a wonderful presentation. And I know you've been a lot of help in the NC20 and stuff. And just thank you for what you do. And it's important to everyone. And we thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to remind uh, Senator, <clears throat> Senator Hayden that we're going to see him on the 12th. Wonderful. I think Commissioner Martin has a question. Well, just to uh, get off the uh, topic just a little bit, but it's still insurance. People, you know, they uh, we have spoken about the huge increases that they're asking again uh, for the coastal communities, uh, for our regular homeowners and everything. Can you speak to that just for uh, to let people know there's two huge big insurance uh, problems that uh, we are facing here in uh, coastal Carolina? That is true. Um, as far as homeowners insurance is concerned, and this only affects homeowners insurance policies, there's actually a difference. Um, a lot of second homeowners have dwelling policies. This homeowners insurance filing from the North Carolina Rate Bureau only affects homeowners insurance policies, which mostly covers those people that live in, in their home year round. Um, so the homeowners insurance uh, increases that have been filed by the North Carolina Rate Bureau, there was a pub public um, comment period, public comment session in Raleigh. The public comment period on that rate filing ended Friday. Um, I believe last time there were 8,000 comments. Last I heard there were over 10,000 comments submitted on this rate filing. But it is upsetting to me in that we've worked so hard since 2008 to educate those in Raleigh about the vast differences in rates across the state of North Carolina, whereas 32 counties and the city of Charlotte had not gotten an increase in their homeowners insurance rates in almost 20 years. In almost 20 years. So the disparity in rates across the state compares to $383 in Charlotte to where it's $2,200 here on the Outer Banks of Currituck and, and elsewhere. Um, for the same Huge coverage? Rate disparity for the same coverage, for $75,000 of coverage. Um, so we've, we, we feel like we've made progress in educating those in, in Raleigh, but when we go into an insurance committee meeting in the House or the Senate and we have a senator or a representative stand up and say, well, is this bill going to cause my rates to go up? We're outnumbered, we're outfunded. Um, huge insurance lobby against us and it seems like it's easy to put the rate increases on the coast and it sounds like an easy fix to say well it's because of storm damage we've proven that wrong over and over in looking at the last two rate filings um, this rate filing was very upsetting because new rates just went into effect double digit increases on the Outer Banks portion of Currituck County, lower on the inland portion, but they just went into effect July 1st of 2013. So there are some policyholders who haven't even seen the impact of that yet because they haven't gotten the renewal for this year yet. They want these rate increases to go into effect August of this year, and the head of the Rate Bureau, Ray Evans, has said that they want to come back every year. The indicated rate increase is 121%. They say they're giving us a break by only doing it at 35% this year or less, that we, our rates really should be 120% more than what they are. And that's where they say they want to come back every year to get it up to that. We say the loss history doesn't justify it. We've, we, you know, we've explained that, shown them the data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we just keep plugging away. Um, we need citizens to get involved and let them know what an impact that this is having. Um, on their life. I mean, it affects discretionary income when you're having to pay more for these other things. So. What, what is the insurance commissioner's uh, position, take, <clears throat> and, and advocacy on behalf of the citizens he represents in Coastal Carolina? The North Carolina Insurance Commissioner, Wayne Goodwin, is the advocate for the citizens <laughs> on behalf of any insurance matter in the state of North Carolina. Um, he actually came out and released a statement after this uh, filing was issued by the Rate Bureau. Rate filing is submitted to the Department of Insurance. The Department of Insurance reviews it. They can either say, okay, we agree with it. You can start using these rates in August. They can say, um, don't agree with it. Um, we deny it. We're going to issue notice of public hearing. He has promised us that he will not 
um, reach a settlement agreement on this rate filing as he did in 2012. He called for hearing in 2012 and it was never held. A hearing is like a trial in that the Department of Insurance presents their side as to why the filing is not accurate. The Rate Bureau presents their side as to why it is accurate and why they need up to 120 percent increase. Um, and then there, there's a decision that's made. He said he will not reach a settlement agreement, which means he won't negotiate with them behind closed doors and come up with a variation in what they've asked for. He said he will hold public hearing, public in that the public can attend. Um, the public will not have any other opportunity to comment on this rate filing um, since this past Friday. But he has promised us, this is his position, this was in his public statement, he actually used the term, he was appalled that this is coming at the heel so soon of a rate increase Who of July. Who is the Rate Bureau made up of? The What's Rate Bureau background? is made up, the, the North Carolina Rate Bureau is made up of representatives in the insurance industry. Oh. So the Rate Bureau who ask uh, are really the insurance companies and they can come back and get their 121 percent. Uh, and uh, unless we have a very, very staunch uh, insurance commissioner, uh, he is our only uh, block and he's on this industry. And he's elected. And he is elected, yes. There has not been a hearing on a homeowner's insurance rate filing since 1993, and the only reason that one was held is because they changed the way they looked at establishing the rates and they started using modeling for the first time to determine our rates based on possible risk. That's, that's the problem. I mean, <clears throat> Ken and I attended Christmas. a meeting with Mr. Godwin some time back in Elizabeth City. I think you may have been there as well. And uh, I, I simply asked the question, whatever happened to good old historical data, I mean, about what we have seen and what has happened in our area? We use don't it. matter. It's they modeling. Don't use it. Everything's about modeling. And worst case scenario, modeling. So that's they what don't. you're paying for. And, and modeling is it not influence. true that the models are designed by the insurance company? The, there is a company um, that is AIR worldwide. That is the modeling company that is used um, to determine our rates on, in the coast. Um, the Insurance Services Office is a company that collects all the data from insurance companies across the United States. The ISO Insurance Services Office owns AIR worldwide. That same one Al Gore is associated with? Mm -hmm. Don't All know. Right. But reinsurance plays a big part of that, and that's a whole other meeting. So. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Ms. Kelly, we appreciate you coming. And uh, please make sure that we do get that contact information so we put it on our website so people watching tonight can go there and get that information. I will do that. Thank you very much. It was Thank a pleasure you. to be back. Do you Thank need you. anything else? I mean, is there anything else that we as a board can do that you can suggest that we, as a resolution? Is there, I mean, is there anything that that you can think of that we need to do? We have a resolution tonight yeah, I know we based on vote. the one from, I think, Onslow County. Mm -hmm. that, that was that was on uh, homeowner's insurance, correct? Right. I was, I was thinking about the, the other piece of it well, as well. Yeah. Bigot Waters deal. I think as long as we continue to communicate and share information, um, it's amazing what we can learn from each other and to further communicate that when we have meetings with our elected officials and um, please let Senator Byrne know we appreciated his support on Senate Bill 1926 and hope he continues his support um, on uh, reform or changes to the, the bigger waters flood insurance. One reform. of the things we could do in the state is our governor mm -hmm. take a lead. Thank you. And, and come out of Charlotte Mecklenburg and come out here to the coast and speak on this issue along with our representatives in Raleigh they could start talking about the devastating effects some of this is going to have so that they become a leader instead of a passive observer. Bingo. That's one thing that could happen. Bingo. You said it. And, Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's very important to, to realize, and tomorrow night we've got a meeting on fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And we've been told by pretty reliable sources that northeastern North Carolina is getting steamrolled by the middle part of the state, that 13 counties out of 100 are controlling the ball game. They've got the bat, the ball, and the gloves. And we in northeastern North Carolina, I'm on the RPO committee, and I've told them, we need to bond together as a force 
And so we've got 20 counties here with a lot of people. And you know what? There's an election next year. That is true. I want to remind everybody of that. There's an election next year. And people in, 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 in Washington, Walter Jones, all these people are up for election. And you know what? Vote speak. So I encourage, tell your friends in northeastern North Carolina, we need to stick together. Send a message. No more. I've had enough. Draw a line. That's it. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. And that is the, the reason NC20 was organized in the first place. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thanks again. Thank uh, we'll move on to our public hearings. First one is PB 1331 AMB Auto Sales. Request for a use permit to operate an automobile sales business. The property is located at 1862 Caratoke Highway, tax map 32. Parcels 87A and 87B, Crawford Township. This is a special use permit, correct? Anyone that wishes to speak in favor of this agenda item or in opposition to this agenda item needs to come forward now to be sworn. Okay, gentlemen, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Woody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a request for a use permit for a auto sales business. Uh, property is currently zoned general business, at least the majority of the frontage is zoned GB. Uh, and in the rear portion of the property is zoned ag. You can see the surrounding uses are pretty much agricultural zoning. There's a little commercial zoning to the uh, southeast of this property. Uh, it does contain an existing business. It has an office, a uh, warehouse component, and auto repair. So it's got a number of other uses that currently occur on the property. Uh, property is rural in the land use plan uh, as it's in the Shawboro Crawford area. And basically what, what the applicant's proposing is to uh, continue to operate the, the office, warehouse, and auto repair functions on the property, but then integrate or add auto sales as a component of the business, which is allowed with a use permit. Um, they held a community meeting on November 20th, 2013, and no residents attended the meeting, so lightly attended. Um, in terms of the existing uses, they will use the, uh, the building the existing building is a sales office, so there won't be any existing buildings added to the site for the uh, car sales. Um, there's a couple of access points to this property from the highway. If you're familiar with it, there's kind of a, it's in the middle of a, of a turn, and, and it's, you know, fairly high rate of speed. So one thing they have proposed uh, is to restrict one of the accesses. It has two, but restrict one access to a, uh, service vehicles or a service entrance and market as such and then trying to uh, use the primary access for any customer traffic that may come in and out of the business which staff thinks is a good idea um, then of course I'll make some improvements for ADA accessibility but that's basically the sum of it uh, in your staff report you have the findings of fact that you're supposed to make uh, for uh, approving or denying a use permits uh, I won't go through those but there's recommended findings by staff included in the uh, case analysis. The TRC heard this request and reviewed it at their meeting. They do recommend approval as presented. Uh, the planning board also heard this request at their January meeting. The planning board recommended approval with a unanimous vote as submitted. Um, that concludes my presentation and I can answer any questions you have. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Woody? Hearing none, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Hyman, you have anything to add to it? I think Mr. Woody covered it pretty well. It's a pretty simple site plan and the expansion of an existing business. And uh, I think the site plan, like I said, it's been through TRC and planning board, meets all the criteria and all the needs uh, for that. But I'll be available if you have any questions. Anyone have any questions of What's, Mr. Hyman? Uh, it's yeah. currently, I mean, currently they have multiple businesses at that location. I know they have a mini storage. That's the, the, the mm -hmm. parcel that we're speaking of, correct? That's correct. They have a mini, I mean, what else is on the, on the, Parcel, Mr. Woody. I mean, I ride by it ten times a day, but I, you know, I know there's a mini storage out there, and I occasionally see some tractors and stuff like that. But what's his, I guess, plan? You know, as far as with the additions. I don't think there's any necessarily um, 
significant increase in terms of impervious surface or anything. It's basically it's just the integrating the auto sales. And I believe he does auto repair on the property That's already. That's the other business within the existing site. And what he wants to do is let the office for the auto for the storage and the auto repair business also be the office for the adjoining auto sales lot. Because so it's, it's two offices, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I believe so. Mr. Benson is here. It's two. Two. I thought you had two. Yeah. And that what he wants to do is, is encourage the parking to come into that existing uh, auto repair and, and storage building. And then there's a walkway to be constructed over to the display pads. How many total acres is this, is this property? That's my last question. The property that's being considered for the auto display is 1.92 acres. He has seven or eight acres. Total. Yes, 7.9. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Now, I will note that there are, there are some other uses on the property that, that probably have grown over time here and there. And there is there is some additional landscaping that's been presented on the site plan that's going in. So there will be some screening added and, and probably a little bit more than you would normally see just for the auto sales. But, again, um, we've worked through that at the site plan level, and that stuff's been integrated. So right. you probably will see a little additional screening and buffering you haven't seen in the past for some of the outdoor storage. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hearing no other questions, I'm going to close the public hearing and ask the board for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve PB 1331 with the staff findings and recommendations included in the case analysis. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Petrie, a second from Commissioner Martin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Oppose, like sign. Motion carries. Uh, item B is PB 1315 Water Supply Standards Request to Amend the Unified Development Ordinance Chapter 6 Required Infrastructure in Chapter 10 Definitions and Measurements to Revise the Water Supply Standards to Exempt cer Certain Development from Connecting to the County Water Supply System. Mr. Woody. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, you I, have I, Before you do that, I believe we've heard this once before and the public hearing was continued to tonight, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, briefly, this was a text amendment request submitted by Mr. White, and the intent of it was to establish that any development or subdivision of land greater than one mile from the water system would not be required to connect to the water system, nor would it be required to provide a bond, which has been the case uh, in our ordinance as it's written today. Um, we've had several meetings on this as part of Mr. White's request. Staff has has worked with Mr. White, and, we, and we've recommended some minor revisions to his original text amendment. Um, I'm not going to go through the amendment verbatim, but effectively it just it just removed the requirement for bonding or for waterline connections beyond one mile. Um, at the November 18th Board of Commissioners meeting, staff was directed to perform some additional diligence on the water supply standards and the connection requirements. Uh, which staff has done following that meeting. Uh, we discussed with the board at your retreat. We discussed at a work session previously tonight. Uh, at this point, it appears that the county is heading in a different direction, that we're looking more towards a comprehensive connection policy uh, when, when subdivisions occur requiring connection to the water system. Uh, with that information in mind, at this point, uh, staff would actually recommend uh, that we move forward uh, and, and not approve this amendment, recommend denial, because it's not consistent with the direction we're heading. Um, again, we've worked with Mr. White on this and getting to the point we're at, I'm just not sure that this amendment's consistent with the direction that we're heading in. Um, I can add any more information that the board would like related to uh, the water system or what we've discussed. You can answer any questions you have at this time. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Woody? Hearing none, I'm gonna open the public hearing reopen the public hearing and I have no one signed up to speak on this issue. Is there anyone that wishes to speak? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and ask the board for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move to deny PB 13-15 due to its inconsistencies with the policy PB 3 of the 2006 land use plan and that the request is not reasonable and not in the public's interest, does not address a demonstrated community need and does not result in a logical and orderly development pattern. I'll second. We have a motion for denial from Commissioner Martin and a second from Commissioner Griggs. Any further discussion? I'd like, to, 
Yes, sir. I'd like to make a statement. One reason that the county is looking into this because the, the people that live in Bravey Shores, I think with their, their fire hydrant problems, uh, you know, we got inundated with that. We're hearing about wells with that are contaminated um, that are in developments. So this is something that, that me personally made me more aware of what needs to be done so we don't continue to, you know, kick these problems down the road. Um, and I noticed the people from Braveview Shores are here, so that's, that's one reason I brought this up. Anyone else? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next agenda item under new business is board appointment of reappointment of Jack Riggle to Whalehead Stormwater Drainage Service District Advisory Board. So moved. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is consent agenda. So moved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion for approval from Commissioner Idlett, second from Commissioner Petrie. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Commissioner's report, uh, Commissioner McCord. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with all the snow and the storms that we've had, you know, the last couple weeks, I just wanted to commend, uh, and he's new to the position. Um, I know his family worked for uh, North Carolina DOT for a long time, but I thought uh, Reggie Saunders and his crew did a really, really good job. Um, sometimes they have a thankless job of just, you know, people complain and this and that. And, uh, you know, those guys were working around the clock trying to keep the roads safe. And I know as being a deputy, we had a lot less wrecks. Um, and, you know, it was a, just a, a big thanks to Reggie. He's a good guy. He cares. He grew up here. I played high school basketball with him. Um, his family, I mean, they're just positive people. And I'm really glad he's in that position. Um, public works, parks and rec, I know everybody was working, you know, to clean up stuff, EMS, dispatch, the sheriff's department. I mean, just like I said, because of them and the county that we live in, we didn't have the problems like you see on in Atlanta and so forth like that. It's just because, so not to throw them under the bus, but I just think those guys did a good job. So, all right, thank you, Mr. Griggs. I have nothing tonight, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Martin. I have nothing tonight, thank you, Mr. Idlett. I did know what uh, Mr. McCord just said. Uh, yeah, we're we're, we're fortunate. Uh, uh, our DOT folks, I mean, they're working with a very minimal staff, and they were out around the clock. And everyone, Sheriff's Department, everybody done a good job. As good as we could expect, that's for sure. Uh, <clears throat> just want to remind everyone that uh, uh, the DOT meeting on tolling the ferries is tomorrow night at Knott's Island at 7 p.m. at the Knott's Island Elementary School. We expect a very good turnout. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Irregardless of how it turns out, I want to thank this board. And I want to thank this county staff for everything that y'all have done. Y'all have worked hard, uh, have truly supported the, 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 the residents of Knights Island, truly supported being against this tolling, and I want to thank y'all personally. Uh, with that being said, anyone who would like to come out tomorrow night to be a part of the conversation, please feel free. You'll be welcome, and uh, uh, we'll see. Maybe 9 o'clock we'll get out of there, but I kind of doubt it. We'll see. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Patry. I'm just looking forward to tomorrow night. The <laughs> um, only thing I would add to what Mr. Idlett and Mr. Petrie said is today, this year, it's the Knott's Island Ferry. That's right. Next year, is it going to be a bridge in Pasquotank County? Is it going to be a section of road in yeah. Dare County? The, the counties and the RPO need to stand firm and not just say no, but heck no. And we are paying gasoline tax already. Which is funding the ferries now. The people in Curry Tuck County will be double taxed with a toll because they're not gonna cut your gasoline tax because you got a toll on the ferry. So this is not just about Knott's Island. Right. This is about Northeastern North Carolina and what Mr. Petrie was talking about the state's being run by the middle part and the western part, and we've got to send a message so everyone needs to come out and comment. And with that, Mr. County Manager. Yes, sir. I actually have two items that I'd like to report to the board. Uh, the first one is, uh, as a matter of just general business, uh, the rating agencies will come out and re-rate communities. Uh, Curta County was up for a reconsideration by standards and poor. 
Uh, we have just finished that evaluation assessment, and I'm pleased to report to the board that our credit rating has actually increased to the better um, after going through this process. And considering the, uh, the state of the national economy over the last three, four, five years, I think it's pretty incredible that we got an upgrade when uh, most others are not seeing that. In fact, I think this is an agency that considered or did actually downgrade the federal government. So uh, I want to kudos to uh, the financial staff and certainly to this board for the fiscal uh, responsibility that you all exercise during your budget process through all these years. Uh, the second one is I'd like to recognize another department. Uh, there was an organization that went throughout the state uh, and did assessments of various different election offices to determine how easy it is for people to have access to the process and to be able to participate in the process. Uh, North Carolina was one of those states that was chosen for this assessment. Uh, and it was reported in the News and Observer at the beginning of, well, actually about the middle of uh, January. Uh, they reported on all the, the 100 counties in North Carolina and where we fell or where each county fell. And I'm pleased to report that Kurtuck County ranked in the top 10. In fact, we ranked seventh as being the seventh best for accessibility and participation in our elections. So I think it's the kudos to uh, uh, Ms. Etheridge and her staff uh, for all the work that they do. And that's it tonight. And I have one last thing I forgot to bring up. Uh, College of the Albemarle and Curry Tuck County have received the North Carolina Community College System prestigious Distinguished Partners and Excellence Award for their collaborative efforts and vision in building the Regional Aviation and Technical Training Center in Curry Tuck County. Um, this is unheard of for a, a municipality or a county to get a partner uh, ship awards such as this and uh, I'm sure it'll be in the newspapers very soon but it's something that the citizens need to be very proud of and I hear a lot of great things about what's going on out there at the at the campus and with that we need a motion to recess the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners meeting and reconvene as the Tourism Development Authority so moved. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Idlett, second from Commissioner Petrie. All in favor, aye. 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 Mr. Scanlon. Uh, you have in front of you tonight for your considerations the TDA. I, I believe it's four budget amendments, uh, all dealing with uh, mm. OctiTax. Uh, one is in support of uh, three economic development incentive programs that the board has, has already seen and approved. Uh, there is a request from the, the department itself to realign monies within the budget. Uh, they've actually had an overwhelming request for printed material that's driven up the, the cost of operating for mailing the materials out. So you see they have a budget amendment to address that. Uh, you have a budget amendment in there to uh, support a, a marketing program at the airport. And the last one is uh, you have... we. we uh, at your last meeting or a previous meeting, the board authorized uh, a contract to employ uh, a, a company to help us deal with the various different issues that were being addressed and confronted with. The tolling of Knott's Island is certainly one of them. Uh, the cost of that contract is being split between Occutax and non Occutax, being sent several of these issues that we're asking them to represent us will have an impact on our tourism industry. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have on any one of those. Anyone have a question? What's your recommendation, Mr. Chairman? Right, Mr. Approval Chairman. of all of them. So moved. I have a motion for approval. Second. From Commissioner Idlett, second from Commissioner Griggs. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? We now need a motion to adjourn, adjourn. the <laughs> Tourism Development Authority meeting and reconvene as a Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners. So moved. We have a motion from Commissioner Idlett, second from Commissioner Petrie. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Now we need a motion to adjourn. So moved again. We have a motion from Commissioner Idlett. <laughs> second. Second from, from Commissioner Petrie. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Thank staff and everyone for coming out tonight.